My 3D printer proves that communism is not inevitable, and so does your washing machine. Karl Marx believed that communism was inevitable. He thought of it as a historical fact, a historical theory that was going to explain the march of civilization in a particular direction and show its eventual outcome, the eventual end of history. Marx based much of his thinking on the work of a philosopher named Hegel, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, who believed in this principle of dialectic, where you had an idea, a thesis, that it came into the world, which invited a sort of opposition, an antithesis, and then they battled it out, and eventually out came a new synthesis, a new thing. But then that synthesis acted as a new thesis, which invited a new antithesis, which caused a continual development that moved in a particular and possibly even predictable direction. Marx took this idea and he made it attached to economics, the material world, a dialectical materialism, if you will, where you would have an economic model, say feudalism, which would invite a certain type of clash, like the, the merchants who are now making all kinds of money and making the wards look bad, such that, you know, King John desperately needs more money from his barons in order to keep up with the merchant class, and then they try to restrain him in with the Magna Carta. And then eventually this fusion is going to create a new order where we have capitalism. And he thought that we had moved through several different frames of existence and eventually we were going to reach something where the state controlled the means of production and eventually that was going to yield to the state kind of willing itself out of existence, which kind of sort of happened in 1991, but we won't get into that. And then you're going to have a stateless, free society where everyone has access to bread and all the needs that they have and all needs are filled because we've just gotten this economics thing perfect. And he thought that this was inevitable. It's important to remember that this is a historical inevitability according to Marx. This video is about how that was supposed to work out within the capitalism jump to state-controlled means of production, how that was supposed to play out according to Marx's logic and why your washing machine disproves that theory stone cold dead. Your washing machine, your personal computer, if you have a sewing machine, that proves it dead too. If you have a phone, that proves it dead too. There's a lot of technologies that haven't followed the normal pattern. Let's talk about threshing machines. Threshing is a miserable, back-breaking, laborious job that used to take all winter long. You would have roving bands of young men who could make a little bit of extra pocket money by going from their farm to neighbor's farms and helping with the threshing where you would take essentially a giant set of nunchucks and beat the grain until the grain fell off of the, the grass, the straw that it's on, and then you could filter all that out. The processing of grass into grain took an enormous amount of time. And the first really profitable technology that mechanized this process were threshing machines, which you can still find if you drive through old country districts. They're often these hulking, rusted out husks. And these machines were enormous powered either by a team of horses or by a separate steam engine that ran it with a pulley, you would have men standing on top of this rig throwing in hay and straw, throwing in straw, hay is something different, and then it would beat it and then sift out the grain and grain would come out the side and all the broken straw would come out the other side and the chaff would be blown away as well. But this is a big machine, bigger than you could probably afford as an individual. So they went on a circuit. You would either bring your harvest to these machines or they would go on a circuit around to the various farms, which means all the money from the threshing is going into one set of hands. And this principle of aggregation scales really, really nicely. You can have large companies set up that just bring the threshers to where they need to be. Same thing happens when we mechanize agriculture even further. The inputs become more expensive. Eventually, you have, used to have something like 90-something percent of the population involved in some sort of agriculture, and right now, in this day and age, it's only 3%. 3% of Americans, at least, are actually involved in agriculture directly, which means the number of people who own farmland and make food is vanishingly small. It is concentrated. New technology entered the scene, and the industry itself concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. Marx observed this phenomenon and saw it in lots of other places. You used to have people in every home spinning some of their own yarn and weaving was an extremely common craft, but then the factories come and they centralize the spinning. 
Granted, it does it way faster. So everyone has more than two or three sets of clothes and feels wealthier as a result. That is a real material gain. But it had this unpleasant consequence of concentrating all of the economic work of spinning and weaving and dyeing and making clothes into fewer and fewer hands who have more and more power. So, if you observe this trend, it actually makes some sense that communism would be inevitable. If you buy the premise that new technology, as technology develops, it is going to always lead to centralization. That centralization is going to be more and more power. More and more economic power is going to be concentrated into fewer and fewer hands. And eventually, these crazy wealthy uh, captains of industry will be able to buy out the government and do whatever the heck they want. And they're going to have tremendous power over whether or not you're allowed to have clothes and whether or not you're allowed to eat and whether or not you're allowed to make your voice heard. And that's bad. So in that case, if, if it's going to concentrate anyway, you can either have, leave it in the hands of the individuals who can do whatever they want, or you can leave it in the hands of the state, which supposedly we all, we all get to vote in and have a say in. And then at least it can be organized for the good of all. And of course you'd pick this one. Why would you not pick this one? This is the thing that you would do. Unless there was something wrong with the premise that new technology always led to a concentration of power because sometimes that works in exactly the opposite way. New technologies come along that disrupt that system and make it far easier for the individual to outcompete the factory. One prime example of this is your washing machine. Laundry back in the medieval period was a miserably back-breaking job, and one that you probably didn't do that often. You used a massive cricket bat, and you bashed clothes that were wet in order to force by mechanical action the water at high pressure out of the clothes, taking the dirt with it. You also would process it probably with fermented urine in order to get ammonia to get rid of grease spots. But it's back-breaking labor in order to get all of the clothes clean. When we finally fast forward to the time when washing machines were invented, they were initially centralized. You would usually send out your clothes in the, the teens and 20s. You would send out your clothes to laundry facilities and they would wash them professionally and then fold them and get them sent back to you. We still do this kind of with dry cleaning. Dry cleaning has not really come indoors. But you know what has? There has been a shift to domestic laundry machines. Granted, if you live in a small apartment, you probably still use a laundromat, in which case you're still paying into a more centralized system. But home ownership of washing machines, this tiny aspect of the means of production, has become extremely common and widespread. Same thing with kitchens. Apartment blocks are not a new thing. The ancient Romans had them. They used to have massive apartment blocks, but since they didn't have elevators, the cheapest apartments were always at the top floor, because that's the one that required you to go up the most stairs. And most of these apartments did not have the means to cook. That was not something that you did at home. You had to go out and purchase food at a vendor. But now, refrigerators and ovens are extremely common. In fact, you would consider them a necessity, probably, if you're watching this. And you have that in your home, which means you have a little bit more of the means of production within your own home. Same thing with computers. They used to be ridiculously expensive, and massive corporations like IBM made their money by selling large massive clunky computers to companies who did all of the data crunching that there was to do. But then there was a revolution in the 80s that brought this technology to the home scale, which then saw a massive outpouring of creativity as people had access to this aspect of the means of production, which you're probably watching this on right now. This idea that occasionally technology does not move in a direction to centralize, but instead to distribute and to decentralize means that Marx was stone dead wrong in his historical theory. Some industries are highly concentrated. Some are highly distributed. And new technology is always ready to upset that balance. Although, in the long run, I suspect it's going to move in the direction of decentralization. Partially for the same reason why extremely large animals have a hard time staying alive. The bigger you grow, the more you need to eat. The smaller you are, the more efficient you can be. This is why there are more bugs by weight than there are humans on the planet, by a pretty significant factor. We are in the middle of another one of these decentralism revolutions in both the cryptocurrency space, which is a total wild west at the moment, and also in the information space. The fact that I, in my living room, am able to communicate with literally thousands of people through a camera which I was able to afford as an average person is mind-boggling. With that kind of information, that kind of power being distributed, 
I also have access to learn just about anything I want to learn. Granted, the discipline required to live in an environment that free is hard because it's also very entertaining to watch cat videos and whatever else on the internet. But the fact that if I wanted to, I could learn the basics of data science just because I want to with no gatekeeper is incredible. Because of technologies like your home computer and your washing machine and the fact that you have tools in your kitchen with which to prepare your own food and the fact that we are able to communicate right now via this amazing thing here is why I think that the historical argument for Marxism is long dead in an eternal kibosh sort of way. That is gone. That is done. That is dead. And there are other reasons also why it was a bad idea to begin with. A bad idea in terms of efficiency and also just horrifically immoral. But the essence of the argument is your washing machine. Marx spent the last half of his life anticipating the inevitable rise of communism, the inevitable overthrow of the workers against the capitalist class, and he just expected that this was going to be around the corner at any minute. This is borne out by his correspondence with his friend Friedrich Engels, that they're always saying that the latest political thing is, we're, we're right on the edge, we're right on the edge, and it didn't happen within his lifetime. And it really still hasn't happened, at least not the way that he envisioned it. The fact that technology occasionally will disrupt large institutionalized bastions of power and distribute that power down to a much more atomized level is the reason why this will never actually happen. Personally, I think that's a tremendously good thing because with concentration of power comes a massive potential for corruption. Concentrated power plus time equals corruption. It's about as simple as that. And the fact that we can distribute that power is, to me, very, very cool. What interests me the most about this idea of technology disrupting centralized institutions is there's a lot of places where it hasn't happened yet. One example is combine harvesters. A combine harvester is an enormously expensive piece of machinery that requires a massive amount of land and a massive amount of money in order to be able to justify it as an expense. A combine is called a combine because it combines multiple operations into one. It chops the grain down, it does the mowing part, and then it gathers the grain, it threshes it, it winnows it, and then it cleans it. And then you have clean grain coming out the back of this incredibly sophisticated machine. All of it happening in real time. And they make these things beautifully machined and beautifully, beautifully precise so that they're able to adjust in real time and follow a GPS and they're very expensive. That's hundreds of thousands of dollars if you want to buy one of these. And you're not going to use a hundred thousand dollar piece of machinery or hundreds of thousands of dollar piece of machinery on a one acre plot. You really need hundreds, if not thousands of acres to justify one of these things. With that in mind, it makes perfect sense that our farming is extremely centralized now. But there's not really any reason why that should necessarily be. In Southeast Asia, there are miniature combines. One example is the Boaz. I'll show a link right here. These micro combines are able to do the same operations less efficiently, but at a way lower price point. And if those ever got cheap enough and say robotic enough, then maybe if you happened to have two acres out in Montana somewhere where you and your family lived, commuting to work via the internet, and the grain got harvested for you by your own personal robot, who knows? Maybe 100% of people will be involved in agriculture directly instead of three. And maybe the means of production would be even more distributed into the hands of the people. There's a lot of areas like that where there is potential for that eventually to be disrupted. Maybe not now, but eventually, with the right linchpin technologies thrown into the right place, that is a thing that could happen. Another example is 3D printing. I personally have a 3D printer, and this is a technology that has only become accessible to the consumer since the patent expired in, I believe, 2005, and then the RepRap movement started, and then they became radically cheaper so that somebody who was a college student at the time could purchase one and play around with it and become reasonably competent. And now, that is what I do as my full-time income. I have a few 3D printers in my office, and I manufacture stuff for people. And that is a factory, a factory type job, something that used to require injection molding at insane prices to do. And now that's something that a very average person has access to. That is an example of a technology that is beginning to disrupt in that direction. I think some of the talk about 3D printers is definitely overhyped. I mean, why you would ever want to 3D print food is beyond me, but there is so much potential for individualized manufacturing, such as when I needed a spare part for my treadle table over here, I made it. I designed it in about 15 minutes and then I was able to print it in another 30. And then I had the part that I needed in my hand right then. In effect, technologies like this that have become accessible to the consumer mean that we already have seized the means of production. 
little bits at a time. I have seized the means of production to wash my own clothes. I have seized the means of production to make my own food in my own kitchen, customize exactly the way that I want it, and to have a little bit of food storage on hand in my refrigerator. And I have seized the means of production with my 3D printer. This is wildly cool stuff. I also have seized the means of production in terms of video editing software and a camera and, you know, a computer on which I can design stuff or write to other people. I have access to publishing, which used to require massive printing presses, but now is something that you can do at home with your own private desktop printer. This is a normal thing. We take it for granted, but we have seized the means of production. Leave a comment below about areas that you think could be disrupted that way, where right now it's controlled by large corporations, but could eventually become much more widespread, kind of like washing machines or personal computers. I would love to hear your thoughts. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe below. We look forward to seeing you next time.